Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Michelle Zahner presenting her new memoir, Crying in H Mart, in conversation with Elise Whitney. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting events every weeknight right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com, where you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Crying in HMart on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Michelle Zahner is best known as a singer and guitarist who creates dreamy shoegaze inspired indie pop under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has won acclaim from major music outlets around the world for releases like Psycho Pump, Soft Sounds from Another Planet, and the forthcoming Jubilee. Joining her in conversation is Elise Whitney, the managing editor of Cravings by Chrissy Teigen. Previously, she was an editor at Rachel Ray Every Day and Bon Appetit. She is a Los Angeles-based Korean-American adoptee who is still working on mastering her dumpling cleats. For so many of us in this past painful, isolated year, myself included, Cooking the food of our childhoods and our cultures has been an act of recovery and reconstitution as much as a function of basic need, a way to return ourselves to the people that we love when they are physically beyond our reach. Michelle's highly anticipated and now New York Times best-selling memoir, Crying in H Mart, is a thoughtful and tender exploration of food's role at this emotional epicenter of our care for others. Expanding on her viral 2018 essay for The New Yorker, she writes through the grief of losing her mother and her quest to reconnect with their shared Korean heritage through cooking in prose as luminous and layered as her songs. Rachel Syme says, Michelle Zahner has written a book you experience with all of your senses, sentences you can taste, paragraphs that sound like music. And Refinery29 says, her writing is powerful, but it is her ability to convey how her mother's simple offering of a rice snack was actually an act of the truest love that leaves the most indelible impression. I am so excited to turn things over to our speakers. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Michelle and Elise. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with a reading. Elise um, suggested that I uh, include the, do the reading of um, a chapter from, from my book called Where Are We Going? Uh, particularly because she wanted to hear me read about fried chicken, which I, I just ate before this. Um, but this was a section that was about my mom's younger sister, Unmi, who is right here. This is my mom when they were children. And we were very close. And this was about um, some time that we spent together when I went to Yonsei, which is a Korean language program in college. You're going on a journey and you have five animals, Unmi said, a lion, a horse, a cow, a monkey, and a lamb. We were seated outside on a cafe terrace and she was teaching me a game she'd learned from a coworker. On the journey, there were four stops where you had to give up one of the animals. In the end, you could keep only one. It was the first time I'd been in Seoul since how many died. I was 19 in between my freshman and sophomore years at Bryn Mawr, and I'd enrolled in a summer language program at Yonsei University. I was staying with Unmimo for six weeks. I'd never traveled to Korea without my mother. For the first time, it was just Unmi and me in the apartment I'd grown up visiting. Us and the obnoxious white toy poodle she'd adopted, named Leon, because when combined with the family name, Ilion sounds like the Korean word for come here. I slept in Nami's old bedroom. By then she had married Imo Bu and I'd and they had moved to another apartment a few blocks away. Sung Young was in San Francisco pursuing a job in graphic design. 
Hamani's room remained exactly as it had been, the door kept shut. The once bustling apartment felt empty at first, but over the course of six weeks transformed into a jubilant bachelor pad. At night, Unmimo would phone, phone in orders for Korean fried chicken and a growler of cast draft beer. We'd sink our teeth into the crackly skin, hot oil gushing triumphantly from its double fried crust as we broke into the glistening dark meat and finished with a cold crunch of the pickled cubes of white radish that came with every delivery. After dinner, we'd tuck our le legs under the low table in the living room and Unmi would help me with my Korean homework. On weekends, we would sit in cafes and fancy bakeries on Garoskiro and people watch. Young women with perfect blowouts and designer handbags passing arm in arm with equally perfect looking men, 90% of whom all seem to have the same haircut. Which one do you give up first? Unmi asked. Definitely the lion, I said. It would eat the other animals. Unmi nodded in agreement. She had a baby face, rounder and fuller than her sister's. She dressed modestly in khaki capris and a thin white cardigan. It was July and we had ordered putting su to share to stave off the humidity. This rendition was far more elaborate than the homespun efforts of my childhood. Its base, a perfect soft powder of snow slathered in sweet red beans and garnished with pristinely cut strawberries, perfectly square, uh, perfect squares of ripe mango and little cushions of multicolored rice cakes. A fine web of condensed milk drizzled over the sides and vanilla soft served towered high on top. And then which one do you get rid of next? And me asked, neatly skimming her spoon along the shaved ice and sweet red bean, a thin thread of condensed milk trailing after it. I mulled over the question, envisioning myself on the kind of journey that would involve many modes of transportation. I imagined handling the large animals with difficulty, wrestling with them to cooperate as I boarded a steamer, a train, a ferry. I thought it would be best to discard the large ones first. I guess the cow and then the horse, I said. Deciding between the lamb and the monkey was more difficult. Both animals were small and easy to manage. The lamb felt the most comforting. I imagined myself nestled in its wool for warmth, alone on a train speeding into the unknown dark. But then the monkey felt the most human, a companion to see me through it all. I'd keep the monkey, I decided. Interesting, she said. So each of the animals symbolizes your priorities in life. What you get rid of first is what you think is least important. Important. What you keep for last is your highest priority. The lion represents pride, which you got rid of first. That makes sense, I said. I was worried it'd eat the other animals, just like pride eats away at your other priorities. Like you can't really love someone if you have too much pride or work your way up to a good job if you feel everything is beneath you. The cow represents wealth because you can milk it. The horse represents your career because you can ride it through. The lamb is love and the monkey is your baby. Which one did you keep, I asked. I picked the horse. Unmi was the only one of her sisters to attend college, graduating at the top of her class with a major in English. She landed a job as an interpreter with KLM Airlines on rotation between Holland and Korea, making her a natural translator for my father and me. In the throes of my paranoia at some day being orphaned by a freak accident, I used to beg my parents to write it into their wills that Unmi become my legal guardian. She was not just my bachelor comrade. She was like a second mother to me. Did you tell my mom about the game? What did she pick? I asked, hoping we had picked the same thing, that she had picked me. Your mom picked the monkey, of course. Thank you. <laughs> that was one of my favorite chapters. I'm so glad you picked it to read. So good to see you. Congratulations on the New York Times bestseller list. Number two, I'm sure to be number one very soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. That damn George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you uh, told me what you ate, fried chicken, right before this, but is that your normal celebration food? Do you have a go-to that when you have happy times, you want to eat? Gosh, um, I feel like basically just carb up uh, during the happy times. Um, it feels like I should be eating Korean food, but um, Peter and I uh, got this amazing chicken sandwich from from Winson uh, that we had last week that felt, before we even found out, we knew that we wanted to eat that today. <laughs> so we were, we, were, we were already planning on celebrate, celebrating regardless of, of the news and uh, it just made it taste all the, all the better. And I've got my, my, my best friends got me a bottle of Vuv uh, for oh. the release of the book. 
and I didn't open it because I was drinking other things. Uh, but I've been, I've been, I'm halfway through this bottle and and I'm bound to finish it by the end of this conversation. <laughs> In honor of you, I opened a yogurt soju because I, I love I it. In Korean. So cheers to you. Do you have your glass? I do. Cheers to you. I hope everyone is having a little drink too. Thank cheers you so to much. You Congratulations. It feels great. I'm so glad that we're celebrating together. Me too. Even though we can't be together uh, in person, this is so fun. We will be- hopefully soon. Very soon. Um, so with that said, in the, the chapter that you read, every conversation in this book, um, I feel like is paired with food. Not, I know that not every conversation in the book is over a table, but I feel like food has woven itself so deeply into everything that you write. So um, is that what sparks memories to you the most, especially when writing this book? Is it the most vivid taste and texture that really helps spark um, the memories of your mother and also of everyone else that you've ever kind of interacted with? It certainly was for my mother. And I think it was always the kind of seed of the idea and and what I knew would be the sort of major thematic vehicle of the book. The book sort of started in, in 2015, 2016. I was working a job at Colossal Media, which was an advertising company in Brooklyn. And I was sort of setting aside my ambitions as a musician and, and trying to shift gears and, and climb the corporate ladder. And I was so miserable, more more than I could have ever anticipated. And after work, I would start, you know, I would I would mix my album Psychopomp, and then I would also work on this essay that I was writing about Mangchi, which was the first essay was this kind of ode to Mangchi because I think after my mom passed away, I sort of turned to this YouTube blogger. I know that you're very familiar with Mangchi, but for those who aren't familiar, um, I would turn to this YouTube blogger who had kind of demystified the Korean cooking process for me. And it was a, just a, a great anchor for me during a really difficult time. So the book sort of started as, as an essay that was just an ode to her. And of course, by extension of like cooking these Korean recipes, I was going to H Mart every week to get the ingredients to cook these recipes. So it, it started um, the first chapter of the book that later got published in the New Yorker. And so I knew from, from those two sort of anchoring points that I was going to use food as a, as a major vehicle for for this book. And so I tried to look back at all of my memories that that largely involved food and and, and uh, sort of ext- extract meaning from them. And, and, and that sort of helped shape the entire book in this way. Yeah. And you told me a really special story about Manchi when we first met about how she helped you celebrate a milestone. Would you like to share that with the group? Yeah, so I met Mangchi, I think, in like 2016. I wrote um, this essay, and before it even got picked up by Glamour, I I went to a talk that she did with Huni Kim, who runs Hanjan Danji, which we went to, and um, they did a and a at 92nd Street, and I just gave her like a printed copy of the essay, and it had my um, contact information because I was trying to shop it to various publications, none of which wanted it, and um she called me after it was published in the New York, uh, in, in Glamour and was like, oh, I'm so proud of you. And I, I totally forgot that, I, like how she could have gotten my number, but she was like really supportive from the beginning. And then uh, I kind of kept her contact information. And then a couple of years later, I did the show with Munchies uh, about, you know, different types of fusion foods. And, and we did an episode on Buddha Chige and I, I recommended her and she came on and it was the day before my 30th birthday. And so I told her it's like, it's my birthday tomorrow. And she's like, oh, come to my house. And so she invited me to her apartment uh, for my 30th birthday. And she made bulgogi and like all her kimchi and banchan. And she got me a little cake. And uh, yeah, she's just been so, such a generous and warm person. I mean, you and I have talked about this before. We're like, you know, she's come to mean a lot to a lot of people. Um, I think probably more than she anticipated, you know, for Korean adoptees and for people who have lost Korean parents or even people who have Korean spouses and sort of like struggling to connect with them in that way. Um, And I feel like she's done a really wonderful job at um, just opening herself up. You know, she doesn't have to, but she really uh, has been really generous um, with her time and, and affection. And I, I really appreciate her because, you know, a lot of people say you should never meet your heroes. And it's been it's been really uh, beneficial to me, actually. Only if it's Manchi can you meet your heroes. Only if it's Manchi. Really, she told me she was proud of me when I met her because I had also gone through a lot before we met. And it was 
like the only experience because I don't have a Korean mom. I'm adopted. I, I love my mom and she's always so proud of me. She's actually watching now. So we can say hi to her. But Manchi is like the quasi like cool Korean auntie. She would not want me to call her, her my, like my mother figure at all. <laughs> because I she know. Would, my, uh, yeah. She's so young. What are you talking about? But yeah, she is just such a a beautiful soul and so helpful to, to both you and I. So I'm really glad that you could share that story. Um, I think that based on just your love of food and the way that you talk about it, that love seems to be your main love language. Would you think, would you say that's true? Yeah, I think for me, like when I think back on memories of my mother, um, a lot of how she expressed love was, was through food and she wasn't, um, coddling by any means but I would be reminded by how much she cared for me and the way that she remembered my preferences and and would go out of her way to take the time to prepare the sort of dishes that I liked well in advance of you know my arrival from college or making sure that I was always taking care of after school I was very affectionately cared for through through food when I was young yeah. And I liked the way that you put it as usuals and how she would know to like put a little extra broth in the stew or to just make something a little less spicy. Um, do you have any usuals now in your life that you think are, or the way that you prepare for your friends too? Yeah. I mean, like, especially now when we're living uh, in an era with like so many dietary restrictions, I, I find myself, you know, I know all like my friends who are vegan. I know all my friends who are vegetarian and gluten-free and what they're allergic to. And, you know, I know Craig or Drummer is allergic to stone fruit and, and tree nuts. So you know, like I find myself like, or like, I know, you know, I pretty much when we go to a restaurant, I know exactly what my husband is probably going to order before <laughs> uh, he does or, or other people in my life. And I, I find that I, I really love people and, and remembering their sort of preferences. And, and that's become an important way that I express my affection as well. Yeah. And um I, I've been a food writer for a long time, but that's not your trade. You write music, you, you write creatively, like you are a creative writing major, but how did you uh, channel this kind of like transportive way of talking about food? Uh, obviously as a voracious eater, I'm sure that that helps, but um, I, even I, I feel like I can't even write about food the way you do. I was just, it was like a masterclass. So I'm curious, like, how you, That's was it always true. the first draft? Or like, how do you describe these dishes that maybe you haven't even eaten in a decade? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing that's great about food writing that I actually find to be a lot easier than, and, than a lot of other types of writing is that you can always like, re, like interact with food at, at any point in time, you know? So a lot of the dishes that I hadn't eaten in years, I was like, oh, it's research and would have to go out and, <laughs> and eat them again, you know? So I had a couple of really wonderful retreats in Korea. I stayed there for six weeks in um, December of 2017 and in May of 2019 for three weeks. And, you know, it was like, oh, I guess I have to like re-eat Bindaduck again, like in order to describe it. And then you're just like, you know, being really observant of like all of your senses. And, you know, I think that food writing is so fun, honestly, because it's so like sensual and, uh, you know, it, and I, and of course I, I read a lot of food food memoir and I, I read a lot of food writing and that was really helpful. And a lot of times it's like, you know, I feel like just really simple, obvious stuff, you know, where you, you know, it's just phrased in a certain way that makes it exciting. You know, it's the same way that you would describe food to a friend or like, you know, exactly what's going on mentally and, and putting that down. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's one thing that was really fun about food writing is that you could just you could eat the thing again and, and uh, have it right there in front of you and, and describe it. The harder parts was like kind of like traveling back in time and trying to like conjure certain memories that you haven't thought about for a while or thinking about like, how do I describe like a spring day when it's like, you know, freezing cold and snowy outside. That was more of a challenge to me, honestly. Yeah. But the other descriptions in the book as well are just so rich. Um, like I could, I was sitting on a plane reading the book because I wanted, I was actually flying to Oregon, your home state. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I have a dedicated amount of time. I'm vaccinated. I'm going to read this book right now. Uh, I'm glad I was alone in the row because I was definitely crying and just really felt like I was there. I felt like I was on Homini's floor eating Jajaman, like just in the, in the crowded room. And um, I was wondering if like drawing those specific memories out and trying to transport yourself back in time, how did you kind of maintain that mental health and not having a floodgate of emotion? Because this is a 
really traumatizing time to relive and it must have been really difficult. So how did you strike that balance for yourself and like kind of have like bunch on size memories? Yeah, you know, to be completely honest, it was a lot of like major breakdowns and, and crying hunched over the computer. And luckily I have a wonderful support system and, and my husband who was a, a wonderful first reader and, and very supportive through this very <laughs> difficult time. And, you know, it was a long process. There is truly um, no skipping steps in writing a book, uh, which I you know, was, you know, to be honest, a little surprised to find because I, I tend to work I tend to think of myself as someone who works pretty quickly and uh, in this process realize, you know, there, it, it just takes time. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was a, that was a big part of it was, but you know, I think for me, I feel I, I was so shocked at how quiet I became in my grief uh, because you know me, I'm like, a, I'm such an open book and I'm a really outspoken person. And when my mom died, I became very quiet and I, I was very confused and I had a really difficult time communicating to other people and understanding within myself, like how to process everything that had happened. And I think I just felt really, um, I was just really compelled to, to get it down and figure out exactly what went on and just like take a moment to take the time to recount everything that happened. And there was so much of it that was really, um, a joy to write, you know, and, and that was a big thing that I, I needed to set up for myself where like the first third of the book is, is largely a really happy time. It was getting to, it was the closest I could get to reliving um, some of the really happy memories that I shared with my mother and uh, to really take the time to sort of revel in uh, my childhood before things uh, got really ugly with, with this illness and, and this treatment. And so, um, I kind of cushioned myself in that way too, like to, to tread very gently in the beginning before I got to the sort of harder stuff that, that took time and, and a lot of sort of coming back to. Yeah, was your writing process uh, very similar or very different to when you write music? It was very different. Um, I think, you know, the, the Japanese breakfast heads will, will recognize a lot of um, shared lyrics and, and titles from, from across all of my records, even Little Big League albums. And um, there are some, you know, borrowed song titles and borrowed lyrics in here. And, and essentially they're all pooling from the same, you know, puddle of memory or whatever. But um, this, I feel like writing music is so much more of an intuitive process. And there's, it's, it's a bit more forgiving in the sense that, you know, you can pick up another instrument if you get stuck somewhere or like, you know, it's just like more impressionistic and you don't, you know, you can, you can leave things in fragments a bit more than, than in a book. Um, and, a, and this book writing process was a bit more heady and just a lot more work. I guess. <laughs> a lot more words, even like your whole catalog, yeah, a lot more words, as many yeah. words as a book. Do yes, you yeah. listen to music when you write or do you need silence? Absolutely not. Could never. I can't even never. read when listening to music. I don't even think I can listen to like ambient I, I might have listened I might have like tried to listen to like some classical music or like ambient music and still like it's pretty hard for me to I I can't really listen to music and do anything honestly um and I always feel like I'm a bad musician in some ways that I I don't listen to much music when I'm doing other things but I also would like to believe I would also like to believe that that makes me a true musician in some ways because I'm constantly yes. thinking about like how things are getting made so I can't focus on on the task at hand if music is on yeah, and there were two important songs in this book. There was Rainy Days and Mondays and mm. Home Home Run, And we both share a love of karaoke. So I would love to know what you think the most impactful karaoke song on your life is. Is it one of those? Is it another song that just really, you know, you reach out and you, that, that's the, the song you feel in your heart? Well, you and I both love our fans of emo, and uh, I would say, um, I mean, certainly the most impactful is the last song in the book and, and that experience. You know, there's actually like a lot of karaoke in this book, which I yeah. like, didn't even realize um, until the end of it. But yeah, the, the book ends in, in a karaoke scene where, where I sing, um, spoiler alert, but uh, the song called <laughs> Coffee Hanjan by the Pearl Sisters. And uh, that experience was like, so tremendous and like such a moving time between my aunt and I and you know the perfect end to the book so I would have to say that that was certainly the most impactful 
but you know selfishly what the song that i enjoy singing the most in karaoke i found recently is um hands down by dashboard confessional yep. <laughs> and as soon as gagopa in new york opens we will be singing that yes we are yeah. we are ready um you actually shared with me and i don't know if you mind me sharing that you sang that at your wedding which wasn't in the book yes we did sing that at my wedding <laughs> uh we we've sang that song many a time and uh it's just i i'm always surprised with how i just know all of the lyrics to that song and uh yeah it's just you know it's such a it's such a jammer what would you describe as the best day you can ever remember always remember your oh own my gosh. <laughs> wow i mean today at least honestly <laughs> like no one no one can take that away from me. And I, no. I'm, uh, I, I mean, in, in recent memory, it's got to be today, truly. Um, I've cried so much today and I'm feeling so much relief and, and it is truly, you know, I mean, no one can deny what, what has happened today. And, and the, the vengeful Korean in me is, is very uh, proud. <laughs> Did you ever think you would write a book when you were, in, when you were at Bryn Mawr or you were younger? Did you always hope to do this? I did in a way. And it's funny because I've said this in an interview before, but in, in some strange way I found, I, I had always considered um, being a writer was a loftier goal than becoming a musician in a way. Um, and and the, I said that in an interview and the, and the interviewer just like laughed the shit out of me. Like <laughs> just laugh, laughed really hard at me. But, you know, because like I was like always involved in the DIY scene, all my friends were musicians and um, it's just a world and an industry that I've come to know really well. Like I even, I, you know, even I had pretty like, real, you know, not realistic, but like I, I had lofty ambitions as a musician, but they weren't like being a Grammy award winning or platinum, you know, record selling musician. I, I just wanted to be able to play like a music hall of Williamsburg. You know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> I wanted to be able to like tour. Uh, and even if I, even, even the loftiest goal I say, I would say like I ever had was like, maybe one day the band can all sleep in one holiday in together. You know what I mean? Like we would each be in like, you know, it would be a four piece band and you'd have two people, you know, bass player and, and drummer in one bed, the two guitars in the other bed, and we would be able to tour the country this way and I would be totally happy. And so those were my sort of goals as a musician, but to become a writer, it seems like somehow even more mysterious to me. So I think that like, I always had this ambition to be a writer. And I think the reason why I became involved in music to begin with was because I always identified as a writer almost even more than a musician. I wanted to be a songwriter. Um, that I that I always had wanted to do this and then when I was in college I studied creative writing and I thought maybe someday I, I might write like a collection of short stories um, of, of short fiction and I really loved writing short fiction and I thought maybe I could do that someday but you know uh, my focus was on music for a while so it's just completely fucking wild that I'm doing both of those things now and it somehow has worked out for me. <laughs> do you think that with the pandemic and having that time because you were in the editing process last year right? Yeah. Do you think that being able to put your full focus on that, not being touring, just really helped the book enrich the book and make it like the best version of the book it could be? Like, I hate to give the pandemic any credit at all, um, <laughs> but, you know, I probably was able to um, focus. You know, I I wrote the last, I believe it was like the last draft um that I, I I worked on on the book and like I turned it in in July of 2020 and if 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 we weren't in the pandemic I would probably be touring and, and much busier and prepping for the album and doing press and so if I'm being completely honest um I I think I it, it definitely did help to to have the extra focus and and take the book to where it needed to be so I'll give you that corona <laughs> And one chapter also that stood out to me was when uh, you go to the bathhouse. And um, I felt that it was kind of a metaphor and, and at least the way that I saw that writing this memoir is kind of a metaphor for being in a bathhouse, like exposed, being scrubbed of your pain, mm, kind of having that I love cathartic that. Um, and feeling kind of refreshed and free, renewed. Is that kind of how you feel now, you know, touring on this on this book? Um, talking about it, having this behind you, but also as part of your future and just going into it feeling a little more like a layer of like, I guess, dead grief has been <laughs> taken from your body. Yeah, I actually just like got chills from, from that sentiment. Uh, 
I, I do feel that way. I don't think I even anticipated feeling this way entirely. I didn't like plan on, I didn't plan on this happening. I just wrote honestly and, and um, from the just very like depth of my core feeling. <laughs> and I didn't even, I don't think I even thought like about what I would feel at, at the end of, at, at the end of all of this, you know, and then like, Today, I, I didn't even anticipate like just how emotional um, I would feel like knowing that I've honored my mom and that like it's been, you know, like recognized at the sort of highest honor. It it was really, really it, it made it made me feel um, so fulfilled in, in, in this way. And, and uh, I, I didn't even expect to feel this way. But yeah, I do feel like, you know, for me, like the bathhouse. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a type of like baptism almost, you know, I'm not like a religious person. I was never baptized, but uh, I, I felt like that experience was like, you know, I was this new, I mean, you're like born again, like without a mother in a way, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, writing this book for her and like honoring her in this way and having it be recognized on, on such a high level is, is uh it's just, I, yeah, I mean, I, I clearly have just no words for it. Like I do, I, I didn't expect to feel this emotional about the experience and uh, it does, it does feel like I can, I can like shed a skin in a way. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm really glad that you <laughs> feel that way. Did you um, consult some of your family members to kind of talk about their POV or just to kind of not, I don't want to use the word commiserate. I'm looking for a different more uh, more gentle word, but just kind of something that maybe you haven't talked about in a couple of years and having to bring up your own memories. Did you consult other family members? I know there's some language barrier for you, but it seems like by the end of the book, you were able to kind of work through that and communicate in a different way. Yeah, I did talk to my aunt quite a bit and I feel like I realized a lot more about my mother's character uh, in doing that. And I was able to sort of like piece together this like new sort of narrative of realizing that there was a lot about my mom that I didn't know, for instance, like, I think my mom maybe never let on about um, her homesickness for Korea and her family to my father and I in the way that she did to my aunt. And I remember talking to my aunt and her constantly like bringing this up, like, oh, I think she did this because she missed Korea. I think she did this because she wanted to make sure to go to Korea every other summer. And I was like, I don't think she was like as obsessed with Korea as like you're like saying here. And then I kind of thought about it. And as I wrote about it, I was like, you know, it's probably because she could never express that to my dad and I. And the person who was getting this all the time was my aunt because she was the person that she would call and be like, I really miss Korea. And, you know, so for her, it's like she's getting this perspective from my mom, whereas like we're getting another perspective. And, you know, even even though like I don't I don't think that she um was like, I, I mean, I, I think that she really missed her home. I think she really missed Korea and she really missed her family. But I think for Nami, like that lens was so much more painted in that way because she was just the person that my mom would talk to about that kind of thing. Um, and so I learned a lot about that and, and that made its way into the book. And then some of the more like logistical stuff of like my my parents and, and their lives before I was born and and, and traveling um, uh, for my dad's job. I, I talked to my father a bit about it, uh, though he is not like the most like reliable or informative uh, <laughs> narrator, I would say. Different perspectives. And I think that that you weave them all together really beautifully. So you doesn't doesn't feel like it's all one sided and only what you think. It, it's very clear that you've encapsulated your entire family's viewpoint. And you talked about how there was some joy in writing this because of the first half of the book and also just ha being able to sit with those memories of your mom that were happy when she was here with us. Um, was there a most difficult moment to relive and a most joyful? Um, you can go in either order or if you uh, want to share two joyfuls, I wouldn't be upset. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, the, the most difficult chapter was was a chapter called Living and Dying, which was um, when my family, you know, after we found out my mother's cancer was terminal, uh, it was after her second chemotherapy, and, and we decided to take a, a sort of trip to Seoul for her to say goodbye to her family and, and um, her home country. And she was in like kind of, you know, after her second chemo, she was like, pretty, it felt like she was pretty stable. And so it felt, you know, even 
the doctor had advised that we'd not do this. I wasn't there for that. I was actually in Philadelphia at the time, which I talked about in the book, but um, you know, they wanted to do this trip and it was one of those situations where it was like, we want, they wanted to choose living over dying and they wanted to try to enjoy some of her last moments. And it just went horribly, horribly wrong. Like she got really, really sick. Um, she went to the hospital pretty much like within the first couple of days that we, of our arrival, we had this trip trip plan to Jeju Island that we had to cancel and then we had to extend our trip in Korea because she was in the hospital the entire time she went into septic shock we thought we were gonna have to put her on a ventilator we thought she was going to die there and um that chapter was very very hard to write and actually when I did the um audiobook I thought I was gonna cry quite a bit but uh the only chapter that I cried reading was was that chapter because I just watched health like like the human body just plummet in, in, the, in, in a very horrific way that I, I go into quite pretty graphic detail in that chapter. And that was very, very hard to write. Um, some of the happier memories were just like funny, like idiosyncratic, like stuff, you know, like I remember, like, you know, it was just such a joy to like write about my mom and I singing, you know, Barbara Streisand and Celine yeah. Dion in the car or like, you know, whenever my mom had a dream about poop, she would like write, uh, <laughs> you know, she would buy a lottery card or the little summer dress that she would wear, you know, in the summer when she made Samgitsal or, um, you know, just like all that really good, like detailed stuff that I didn't think much about. Like that was that was what was really good and, and, and a joy to write for me. Do you feel that that balance kind of helped you get through it? Kind of like touching on like the mental health and kind of just like allowing yourself to feel your feelings, but also giving yourself some joy. Totally. And I think that like the, the theme of food really helped sort of lend itself in that way because, it, you know, like there's a horrific relationship that you have with food during illness, but there's also like so much joy in that theme and was something that I got to lean into. And I feel like that's something that I, realize it's so important in, in art in general and something that I do in my music a lot where you sort of, you know, can present these heavier topics and, and create like this, this more uplifting sonic landscape that, that helps to balance those two. And that's like what the human experience really is in a way. Yeah. And this story is just as I couldn't tell you enough how incredible it is. And I was wondering if you would ever allow it to be adapted into a television show or a movie. And do you have yeah. dream casting? <laughs> Is there a secret? Your eyes are shifty. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that it's going to be announced pretty soon. But I think it, it, it there's a very uh, likely chance that it will be um, option to be a film. Oh my God! Congratulations in it. Okay, wait. What's the like a break a leg? I don't know what to say, so I don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to cast Fingers crossed, yeah. yourself and your mother and Peter, who would you cast? Um, Peter has requested that uh, Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> I met Peter. He does not look like Timothy Chalamet. At all. <laughs> and Timothy Chalamet is like, well, what? he says, shut you down. Younger. Yeah, that's. Uh, not well, you know, we were we were that age when we when this all happened. You know, Peter yeah. was like twenty. Is Timothy like twenty three? Yeah, he was like he's much younger, but you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, he requests Timothy Chalamet. Um, you know, there's no half Korean actress that like is that I know of, so I don't really Aquafina know. Is that's half like Korean. in the early half Korean, half Chinese. That's true. That's true. But I feel like there would have to be. I would love to have like a half Korean, half you know, someone with my actual like yeah. you know backgrounds. Um, and and that like yeah, that would that would be great. And also like Aquafina has played you know so many iconic so many leads yeah. I have so many iconic Asian leads that I feel like she is like off to, to other things now but um yeah I don't know I made a joke the other day that you know Emma Stone are our biracial queen <laughs> Scarlett Johansson will play you yeah Scarjo and Emma Stone will play me I think I forget her name unfortunately but um uh, I would love to see like the mother in Parasite, the like the bougie mother yeah. in Parasite play my mom. Uh, but uh, maybe like in a few Incredible. Years. I, mean, I definitely would love to like have a, a, a Korean actress play my mom because I am very sensitive about um, Korean accents when they're not like yeah. true. The the mother from Minari was also incredible. I, I'm blanking on yeah. her name now, but she Han, is- y like, Yeti, Yeti Han, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she would be Yeah, she's, she's too young, but like she yeah. is- Incredible. Some I age makeup, so just a little age makeup. Yeah, yeah, a little age makeup. <laughs> um, and if, you, you know, hopefully this happens, would you want to write the music for it? Would that be too close to home? 
No, I would love to write the music for it. If, if that have you ever happen. written like a score of any sort, just just instrumental besides like kind of the longer? I have, stories? yeah. I, I just have. Um, I wrote uh, the soundtrack for this indie game called Sable that's coming out later this year. And it's like two hours of instrumental music. And, and so I, I have some experience and, and I, I hope that they'll, they'll have me if, if that happens. Um, also the cover of this book, uh, it's just so striking. And I was wondering your inspiration behind it and what noodle is that? What noodle dish would those yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's actually a Korean woman who illustrated it. And I'm so happy because uh, it's not Kim. And uh, I've loved her book covers for years. And I always thought like, if I write a book, I would love for her to do it. And I was so happy when, when she uh, got to do it. And I really, love the cover um it was actually I, I might post it pretty soon but the the alternative cover I, I was really torn between because it was like two scallions that holding. sort of made up an h oh it was I'm like two the UK cover maybe the one where it's like a woman holding oh yeah that's the uk cover but the yeah. one that we this is like the fourth option or something uh -huh. like that and um yeah i was kind of like concerned because it used to have like scallions in it and i was like i don't really know like of a korean dish that looks like that those look more like chinese noodles and then like, and then I realized, you know, these could kind of look like somyeon noodles, which are like these thin, like white noodles. And I actually made some last night because I made this like dish called kolbengi muchim, which is like whelk, which is like a sea snail, like yeah. drinking snack with these like sort of white noodles. And in Japan, they're like somen noodles. Yeah. Uh, so they do have this kind of noodle in, in Korea. Um, so I don't think that, you know, it's like the most iconic noodle that you would think of in Korea. Yeah, but then it's that's what makes the cover unique. It's it's a little yeah. bit curious. And I think it's fitting because you know a lot of the dishes in this book are like not the most popular no. Korean dishes, you know. They're they're kind of like more obscure dishes that that I randomly dove into in, in this book. Yeah, and you mentioned maybe wanting to do like a pop-up menu in Eugene and like at Sun at Sunrise Mart. That's the grocery store. What's the name of the yeah. The restaurant that you would go to? Soul Cafe, yeah. Soul okay, Cafe. Soul Cafe Soul, that my mom yeah. always called it Soul Cafe. <laughs> yeah, I hope that they get more business from this book because they're like a really sweet family. And, oh, you know, that's amazing. the guy is like so stressed out all the time that <laughs> I, I hope that he gets some, some help or something. <laughs> and I feel like when you said in the book that you didn't feel like a real Korean after your mother died, I, I could relate to that as being an adoptee yeah. and figuring out my Korean identity, which I feel like I've done in the past few years. Um, do you feel that writing this book and also just being more reflective and understanding that Koreanness is kind of a fluid thing and that it's not just black and white, um, do you feel now like that you're like a real Korean? I do. I've actually, I was so worried about like the Korean American reader and writing this book that I sort of like gaslit myself, I feel like into thinking like, am I even like, do I know what I'm talking about, even though it's like my whole life, you know, and like, I just was being honest. And I've, ha I've talked to a lot of Korean American people and, and they've, you know, some, some full Korean American people with, with parents, both parents that are Korean, uh, you know, have said things along the lines of like, you're more Korean than I am. You got to go there like every other summer and stuff. And I found that like, you know, even, I remember even my mom expressing to me that like there were certain parts of her that made her feel like she wasn't really Korean anymore. You know, she forgot a lot of like the sort of custom and stuff that like Nami was really used to her sister. And, you know, I think that that I've learned that that's like such a huge part of the Korean American experience. And like even talking to you about it makes me think about that a lot because like, you're full Korean, but you're adopted and you have this entirely other different kind of relationship to your Korean heritage and being mixed has this other type of relationship being, you know, Korean and even Korean American people who with like two, with two parents who are Korean who are raised here and have never visited Korea or speak the language in any way. Like there's so many different ways to be Korean and, and we all kind of question our identity and our sense of belonging in this way. And I think that that is ultimately, you know, just a part of being, human and also a part of being Korean. So I think that like, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that I've learned that uh, that's a really natural thing to feel and, and to, to be okay with it. And that, um, you know, everyone else is like really pissed off at like these kind of like shitty gatekeepers of, of our culture and recognizes that they suck, you know. <laughs> but do you feel more connected to the Korean and the Asian community more than ever given the really awful year that we've had and everything that's going on um, with the violence and hate against anti-Asian hate, um, does it make you feel it's 
more connected, but just in a, a different way. It's, it's, it's not like a, it's a uplifting connection. I feel that you can talk to people that are like you and look like you and um, kind of come together, but also just knowing that we're up against this really scary time. Has that made you feel a little more connected to the community overall in the past like year and change? I mean, I think that like, honestly, just the change in times um, has made me feel so much more connected to my community in this way that like, part of it is just like there being an online community that makes it so much easier for you to connect with people who are like, not only, not only share the same kind of heritage as you, but like also have like-minded interests, you know, because like, I don't like in the same way that I don't want to just like be friends with another human being, like I want to like, you know, have friends that are like, uh, you know, share this heritage and that importance, but also like have similar interests in me and like the internet in some ways like has opened that community up to me in, in such a big way and having this platform and and making the art that I have in the past year has, has made that uh, so much more accessible to me. But certainly there is a new like interesting reckoning with this time that, um, you know, we're all sort of like acknowledging and, and being honest about these experiences that we've we've all dealt with for the first time because I feel like so much of like our culture and our unique experience with our race is like about sweeping these types of experiences under the rug and it makes me feel like emboldened to see my community finally speaking up about this type of stuff uh, for the first time because I know that I have always like kind of made a joke about this kind of thing you know because like that's what made me feel comfortable and that's like sort of how I was taught to cope with it like if someone said a racist remark or did something uh, that was like kind of violent towards me like I felt like the way to cope with that was to make a joke out of it and I feel like it's the first time in my life that I've I've I feel like emboldened to not do that anymore and I think that that's really important and I, I'm really grateful to my community and 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 feel um like that's some that's a that's a big change for a lot of us yeah and from not knowing your mother, but only knowing her through your eyes and your words, it seems like her strength was a huge asset. Um, what trait do you think that you got most from your amma? Oh, I love that question. Um, you know, I've always felt like so different from her in a way because she was she was very patient and very stoic and could be very private and withholding in this way that I always envied and and felt so much more like my dad. Um, and it's hard to say like the things that I, uh, I think I love people the way that she loved people, you know? And I think that I, she was observant uh, in the way that I, and I think I, I got that from her. Um, and she, ha she was, you know, very effervescent and social and charismatic and, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I, I think I definitely got those things from, from her as well. <laughs> from knowing you and being your friend, I can agree with that. Um, <laughs> she was very, very cute. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want to let everyone know I'm going to wrap with one question before we move on to Q&A. So if you have any Q&A questions, drop them in the little box at the bottom. Um, the thing, I actually spoke to my therapist about this the other day about saving 10%. Um, um, oh, wow. I think that is such an important lesson to save 10% for yourself. Um, how do you feel that you do that for yourself now? especially as we've spoken about this in this day and age where things are really hard. We've lived through a pandemic. You um, have, we've all dealt with a lot in this past year. So how do you feel you're saving that 10% for yourself now? It's hard to say because like, you know, it's very private, like how you, yeah. how you hold um, your 10%. But I think that I think about that all the time. Uh, and I feel like, you know, like when I watched Minari, like the Minari is like the 10%, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and like that movie, like that scene like moved me so much because like, that's like very much like, um, and it, part of the immigrant experience is like knowing that at any point in time, like everything could go to shit and yeah. you just need this like little kernel of something to like start again. And this expectation of doing that. And in some ways it's like, you know, that Minaria, like this weed basically is like the thing that they like, that's their 10 to cents that they like save to like start over in a way. Um, and you know, like in a way, like 
my whole career has like kind of been that, you know, like when I like started this project, like I had really given up I my hopes that, you know, that the, anything would ever happen for me as an artist, as a musician or as a writer. But I, I always like, I think I kept like 10% of like that faith in a way, like, and, and that was what the seed of all of this was. And it's, it's truly blossomed. And so I, I, I credit my mother for that advice and hugely. Well, I can't wait to watch you grow. And uh, thank you so much for this. Thank you, Elise. And, and we're going to move on to Q&A. So I'm going to navigate to the little box. Anyone has questions? Um, I think that we can do, I think we were given like 15, 20 minutes. So I'm going to try to get through them all. Um, the first question comes from someone who's anonymous. Oh um, and it says, there's... <laughs> There seems to me that food writing is pigeonholed as a domestic women's genre. As a woman of color, how have you broken that barrier? We are both women of color writing about food, so we're both breaking those Wait, barriers. Sorry, sorry. What what is the question again? <laughs> um, there seems to me that food writing is pigeonholed as a domestic women's uh, genre, and as a woman a woman of color, how have you broken that barrier? I mean, I feel like you know, I the book isn't like a, a book about like home cooking or, or anything, you know, like yeah. for me, like the book covers so many different uh, aspects of like the human experience. It, it's much more a story about mothers and daughters and coming of age and grief. And so, you know, I, 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 I certainly like didn't think much about like, how am I going to break like domestic women barrier of, you know, writing about food in any way. So for me, it's just a, it's about the all encompassing like human experience. And, and I tried to write that in, in a, in a literary way that I feel like, uh, you know, transcends like that pigeonhole. Well, that's a very good answer. And another person actually <laughs> asked, um, right after that might be the same person that they'd love to know which food writers or other artists whose work centers food that you've drawn inspiration from. You talked about some memoirs that you read if you want to share any of those. Yeah, I really love um, MFK Fisher's writing. Uh, she wrote The Gastronomical Me and Consider the Oyster. And it's like of such another time. And it's just like really delightful to read. Um, I reread uh, Hemingway's Movable Feast, which has some like excellent food writing. Anthony Bourdain's A Cook's Tour. Um, there's a story called Back to the Beach that I really love about his father and, and revisiting this like coastal town in France and, and, and eating his way through that city. Um, that I really loved. I loved um, Ruth Reichel's Tender as a Bone. I also really loved this book called The Vegetarian by Han Kang. Uh, and that sort of gave me a lot of ideas about the ways that you could, ex you know, sort of stretch the expectations of a food, food memoir in the way that like you could, you could also write about the more menacing qualities of food and, and calorie counting and, and not being able to eat certain things because of um, chemotherapy. So I really love that book because it gave me um, some really great insight into how to how to write the more about the the sort of like scary underbelly of of food. Yeah, great picks, everyone. Uh, Harvard Bookstore. If you sell any of those, please drop them in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Lauren, actually a friend of mine who's watching. Hello, Lauren. Um, do you find any differences between what informs your music and what informs your writing? She's also a food writer, so a very cool question coming from Lauren. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, there's just so much more space in writing prose than there is uh, in music. And yeah, I mean, it's great that like, you know, there's only like maybe, there's like probably less than a thousand words on an album and there's like, you know, maybe 80,000 in this book. And and so I think it just like gives you so much more room to like tell a story. And one thing that's been really exciting about writing a book and, and seeing the differences between that and, um, you know, an album is that like, it's such a direct line of communication between a reader uh, and, and a listener, you know, like uh, I've, I've had like such profound um, messages coming from from readers that, you know, I, I get like as a musician, but I think it is, is a bit more intense when, when, you know, you're just so like explicitly there in this way that like, there's a little more mystique behind uh, writing mu music. Yeah. There was a question that just disappeared. I swore I saw it anonymous person asked if you pair uh, music with your meals, like playlists or anything. Oh, that's great. Um, I 
I don't know if I do that very often, though I feel like sometimes when like my friends and I have like themes like Italian dinners, we'll put like uh, like an Olive Garden <laughs> playlist on. <laughs> But beyond that, I don't, I don't really, I feel like, oh, one time we did, we were doing a lot of like theme dinners during the pandemic. And I think one night we did like a German night and like we're listening to some like German, German music. That was pretty fun. <laughs> um, Liz asks, uh, you mentioned that the music writing process is more forgiving than creative writing. Do you feel that cooking is another forgiving art form? And that's why it was a foundation for your book. What's been the most forgiving meal you've ever cooked or enjoyed? In other words, what's a meal that could have been a disaster but turned serendipitous? Great question, Liz. Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, uh, what have, I'm trying to think of like what I've made lately that's like turned out surprisingly well. Can you think of anything? That's boring. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of the Korean dishes that I've made um, have turned out surprisingly well, and maybe it's like deeply rooted in my genes or something. But um, yeah, I made uh, Mangchi steam dumplings, and I definitely thought that those were going to turn out pretty poorly, uh, maybe like a few months ago, and, and those turned out really well. They're like, you know, they're like big dumplings, but like, I'm not a very good baker, and so I, I thought that that was going to go very, very poorly, and uh, turned out surprisingly well I've made some really excellent um uh like Greek dips in recent memory that I thought was gonna go terribly and oh and you know what I made a really great uh falafel that I didn't have Ooh. much faith in and, and turned out like pretty well that's amazing you know what you got to get innovative when you're at home cooking for an entire year it's true it's true I made uh some interesting things in the beginning and now I'm just <laughs> like I can't even think about <laughs> being creative right now <laughs> Liz also asked what is the painting in the building behind you what is the, the one above this your head one, right? yeah this one yeah this is from a uh, new year's show um that we played in I think 2019 we did like three dates at um this local venue in Philadelphia called I'm in Brooklyn but when I lived in Philadelphia, we used to go to this bar called Johnny Brenda's all the time and they have great shows there. And so we did a residency for three days and my friend Mary Vertulvo um, did this incredible illustration of like me and all my friends that were involved in the, in this like three day residency on New Year's Eve uh, at Johnny Brenda's. And that's what that painting that's is. That's amazing. I love that painting. New Year's yeah. Eve, remember celebrating. Remember <laughs> celebrating. Well, hopefully this year. Yes, I, I believe in that. Yeah. Um, I actually do too. You have a congratulations from our salon. Um, it's a little bit long. Give me a second. Hi, Michelle. Ooh. Firstly, congrats on making it to the New York Times bestseller list. I'm so excited to get my copy in the mail tomorrow. Also excited to catch Jay Brecky live in Boston in July for the fourth time. My question, yeah. is, my question is rooted in the wider Asian experience being of South Asian origin myself. So there's this enduring tradition in Eastern cult cultures of anchoring mother figures with their quiet strength being the glue holding many lives together, especially their children's. Mm -hmm. And that's reflected in literature by Asian and Asian American authors. Here, I'm thinking of Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior, Ocean Vuong's On Earth, We Are Briefly mm. Gorgeous, and many others. How do you see Crying in H Mart fit, this, fit in this tradition of maternal love and lore? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I was like kind of self-conscious about that and, uh, when writing this because like I feel like there's this like new discourse going around about like how like Asian people can only write about like like tear tear jerkers about their mothers and I was like kind of self-conscious about it but honestly like you know I just wrote about my experience um, as honestly and as detailed as possible and that to me is like all I and maybe capable of as, as an artist. And I think that it's just really important to have as many like varying um, multi-dimensional voices and characters as possible in our community in the same way that they have in other communities and, you know, like in, in, in white literature or whatever. Um, so, you know, I had to like, I had to like kind of, move, you know, like my story is about my mom passing away, you know, and like, I don't know if I would have written this story if she hadn't and I, I hadn't felt this like real need to tell this story. Um, and so it came from that place. And 
Uh, I don't know how it will fit in. I hope that it finds like a snug little home with those books because they're they're such incredible books, and and I'm I'm glad to be a part of that of that you know community. Yeah. And the next question, um, uh, anonymous attendee, something that really struck me when reading um, was how little you wrote about your success in music and really did focus on your mother's story. Is this something you want to write about more in the future, possibly a second book? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, it was definitely a conscious effort to not write about my life as a musician. And I think that I had some fear about, you know, confusing this main theme of, of food with my love of music. And I also, you know, just I didn't want people to think that this was a sort of memoir from like a legacy artist like, you know, Patti Smith or like Kim Gordon um, that like was about how I came to become this musician. You know, I'm really not there in my career at this point. Uh, and I would never think of myself that way. It's very much a story and was always going to be a story about my mother and our relationship and this sort of experience of how I kind of like restored her memory in a way through this like pre preservation of our culture through food. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really, really steered away from that theme for a long time until I realized, you know, there were parts of it that were important to incorporate because it was a major turning point in my mom and I's relationship in my adolescence where I really fell in love with music and that was a major kind of like point of contention for us for a time and 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 sort of like a really fitting way to have the bookend um so yeah I that was definitely a, a conscious choice um and it's it's something yeah I, I would love to write about uh in the future I don't I don't know how immediately in the future but uh, <laughs> I, I can see myself uh exploring that more later on yeah and someone actually asked a question uh, about your relationship with your mother. Um, Amy says, Michelle, I really admire the way you portrayed your mother and your relationship with her. It felt very true to how daughter daughters and mothers love each other. Was it difficult for you to write about the bad parts of your relationship? And she also asked uh, what, randomly what your favorite Joanna Newsom song is. Oh my God. Um, I love the ease, like the album, like pretty much all of the songs off of her second record, the ease. I think like, I can't remember like the fourth or the third track on there, but I do really love Emily. Um, and I actually, that was one of the last shows I went to before uh, the pandemic started was, was uh, Joanna Newsom and it was incredible. Um, I, I love her and I'm probably gonna listen to these after this. But um, uh, the other question was, talking about how about my mom and I's relationship and 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 was it difficult to write about the harder times it was really difficult because no one wants to be the villain or like no one wants to admit that they were wrong and it was definitely really hard to sort of like try to paint myself as the protagonist and as as someone that was also very wrong and and not uh totally perfect during that time either and and it but it was so important because like you know I don't blame my mom entirely for the way that she reacted to my behavior at that age um and and it was hard to like show myself in a negative light so like that was definitely a, a real a real challenge and and I and I you know I'm glad that I wrote it because I feel like in writing it I was able to forgive myself for a time that I I often really really regretted and and, and I'm very embarrassed about um but I think it was important to go there yeah and it, it really worked out you you were able to again strike that balance it doesn't feel that you're honing in too much on the bad. You're you're balancing the bad and the good. Um, I was informed that we only have time for a few more questions. So I'm gonna try to condense a couple as I skim. Um, actually, um, Moon Lin, another friend of mine who runs Heart of Dinner, the amazing wow, look at all your is here in the house and she uh, wants to congratulate you on everything. And her, this says, this convo has gotten me really hungry. What's your favorite Korean eatery in Brooklyn or Manhattan? I really like, um... Chongro in Manhattan um, and that is like one of my favorite barbecue spots what else do I like I think an underrated place in green uh, in, in Brooklyn that's in Greenpoint is called Miss Oho and they're kind of like a newer Korean restaurant that I've ordered takeout from for a few times and I, I highly recommend it awesome another person Iris asked what's a food concoction that you eat that you don't think anyone else would eat um especially when in writing to get you through maybe a college meal you'd never eat again, but you ate all the time back then. Uh, one like kind of gross thing that's like not a meal, but a snack. Uh, and when I was in elementary school, um, 
my best friend was half Mexican and her whole family ate hot Cheetos with lemon juice. And that is something that I just have kept with me all these years <laughs> and still eat. That's like totally disgusting. Uh, but I really like dousing hot Cheetos with lemon juice and eating them with chopsticks. You know what? Then you don't get your fingers dirty either. Exactly. <laughs> um, Sean asked, do you still write short fiction? And if so, what, what sort of stories do you usually find yourself writing? And when will we get to read them? I have not read written short fiction in a very long time since college. Um, I wrote uh, a number of like kind of like dirty realist like stories about couples that like ran a beef jerky store. I wrote a story about loosely based on my aunt having cancer called Rosebud South, um, but they were written as white people because I felt like my story would never um, make sense uh, if we weren't white. So I wrote it in, uh, I, I like took our Asian-ness away and, and made my aunt and I, my aunt and me, Aunt Emmy, and instead of eating Korean food, we ate like chicken and broccoli. So I was like, that's what white people eat. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I would love to try to write short fiction again. I, I don't know uh, if any point in the near future, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if I, if I tried it at some point, especially after this very validating experience I feel like I, I can do whatever I want now <laughs> yes the world is your oyster um your oyster pancake um yeah and uh Juliana asks uh she says I love the noodle scene in your recent video which is amazing everyone should check it out for posing in bondage uh will Jubilee incorporate similar concepts to your book uh she is very excited for the album as am I the persimmons thank you um the album is very different from the book and I don't feel like uh there are too many themes that carry over in the record but I feel like they're in conversation with one another in a way because I felt like I had to write crying in H Morn in order to write this album about joy and and sort of give myself permission to write to explore a different theme entirely oh, absolutely and uh let's see I'm going to choose one last question oh my goodness there's so many good ones I'm really sorry that we can't get to them all but let's see. Oh, this is a really beautiful question. Um, Tian asks, is there anything that you wanted to express to your mother that you didn't when she was alive for whatever reason? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I will say that like one, one thing that I am very lucky was that um, I got to spend a lot of time with my mom before she passed away. We were together for six months uh, as, as she was going through this illness. And I'm very glad that I got to be there with her through every step of the way. Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything that I would say to her that I didn't get get to say to her. I, w I wish just so badly that I could show her everything that I accomplished. And I wish I could tell her, mom, I'm the New York Times. Because <laughs> she would be, she would be very tickled by, by everything that's happened. And um, yeah, I would just tell her that I love her and I miss her. Well, I feel like that's a really beautiful way to end. Congratulations on your New York Times bestseller, on this amazing Thank book, you. on your forthcoming album, on your new music videos, on your Spotify singles, <laughs> everything. And uh, everyone, please pick up the book, Crying in H Mart at the Harvard Bookstore. Please support your local bookstores and uh, check out Michelle on the road this fall when we can all sing at concerts together again. Thank you so much, Elise, for doing this. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Harvard Bookstore. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes. Okay. Good thank night, guys. So thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Thank you for being here. Good night. <laughs>